We open to Seven of Nine practicing smiles in a reflective surface until an interruption by the dog stops her. They're off to look at some sort of science wibbly with Paris, and the dog's excited to get going. He's even brought his camera. To a shuttle we go, specifically a Class 2 or Type 9, depending on who you ask. That nose might be sleek, but it's hardly providing a spacious interior, a fact not helped by Bellana also being present for this little jaunt. The science wibbly we're out here to take a look at makes itself known, and rather more so than anticipated, catching the shuttle in a bit of a kaboom. On Voyager's bridge, Kim's telling everybody about a distress call from the shuttle. We move in to assist and get ready to teleport them out, though the teleport operator says it'll be rough because of the science wibbly. It must be serious indeed for the show to pay speaking part rates for an extra, and Chicote awaits their arrival with bated breath. The teleport effects begin to flicker, and about a half a second after my brain screams, oh gods, please don't be a body swap episode, the extra says he's having trouble separating them. The gods are with me, and they seem fine when they arrive. All except the doctor, anyway, who has a bit of a glitch, then tells us his mobile emitter has been damaged. Balana switches him back to sick bay, and just as well, that emitter looks pretty fucked up. The doc gives us a concerned call, not reassured by Balana saying she can probably fix it. She takes it to a science lab and starts a diagnostic, telling that extra to check on it in the morning. The mobile emitter starts sprouting tubes and taps into the console, replacing the screen interface with one that looks suspiciously borgy. As that ensign will be the first to find it, and he's been given a name and lines, let's assume he's important and give him a name of our own. If you're new to the channel, the Wheel of Names is a collection suggested by our patrons. When someone who looks important to the story comes along, we shit a random name at them and hope it fits. As the wheel currently has no fewer than three ensigns on it, the chances for this one are better than most. Our extra's new name is... Ensign Henry Jim, suggested by Ensign Jacob Blatt. That's probably not going to help convince the people who think this is rigged. It's morning, and the doc calls Bolana. Actually, that's not true. The doc appears on her screen while she's still unconscious, and a connection is made without accepting, which feels like quite a privacy concern to me, but let's ignore that for now. He wants to know what's happening with his mobile emitter, which, when you consider it's the only thing stopping him from being under permanent house arrest, is probably fair enough. Balana disagrees and hangs up on him, but she's out of bed now anyway, so she goes for a noise shower. Or tries to. Looks like the dock has free reign over all the cameras on the terminals, though I do find myself wondering why Starfleet installed one in the shitter. Balana solves the issue with a towel, and we leave her to it. Besides, his mobile emitter is already busy. Whatever it's doing, it's enough to make Seven wake up with a start. Something's off, and she feels it. So much so that she goes to the bridge to warn them. One of her Borg implants is pinging, and she thinks that might mean some of her old friends are around. Not so, according to scans, but we'll check again. In the meantime, Chicote suggests Seven visit the dock for a check. Ensign Henry Jim is on his way to the science lab. The door opens to reveal something is very wrong indeed, and instead of calling an immediate security alert, he goes in and starts scanning shit, so as far as I'm concerned, he deserves whatever he gets. Twat. Walking up nice and close to the emitter gives it a chance to fire into Ensign Henry Jim's neck, causing another ping for Seven and an alert on the bridge. That lab sucking up lots of power and not responding to calls. It also now has a Borg shield, so it's time for the mood lighting and a security team. We call Seven to let her know she was right, and they all meet at the doors of the lab. There's a gizmo in the centre that Seven says looks like a maturation chamber, basically a Borg womb to grow children until they're physically useful. Ensign Henry Jim is found unconscious, but not assimilated. The neck pipes took a sample, but otherwise ignored him, though we do learn that the minibots it left behind match sevens. Looks like the teleporter fucky earlier stuck some of her tech in the mobile emitter. Ensign Henry Jim is dragged to sick bay instead of teleported, which also removes the other two guards. Seems like a bad choice all round to me, but maybe they've already figured out how this happened and are worried about more teleporter shenanigans. Once they've left, Seven takes a closer look at the maturation chamber, saying the tech won't consider her a threat. A bit of a poke opens the viewing hatch, and we get a look at the Borg baby inside. This is confusing to Seven, as she says Borg don't reproduce, only growing their ranks through assimilation. I guess that makes this Borg Jesus. Time for Janeway to take a look. The ensuing chat tells us what we've already guessed, that teleporter glitch stuck minibots in the mobile emitter. 
They're designed to make use of whatever they find, which is why they built this. What's not known is why they made Borg Jesus instead of just assimilating Ensign Henry Jim. Maybe they detected that he was an utter fucking clown. Something more's going on here, and Janeway wants to know what, saying we'll allow the process to continue after putting a force field around the whole thing and posting guards. We're going to keep an eye on shit, but from the safety of astrometrics, in the space of a couple of hours, Borg Jesus has grown to resemble an average six-year-old human. Well, if you ignore all the robot bits, anyway. And they're fancy robot bits, too. The armor plating is the same material as the Doc's mobile emitter, which might be a problem, as that emitter is 29th century tech. If the minibots copied the casing, they might have copied some of the other stuff too, and having a Borg with tech 500 years ahead of us might not end well. The Doc, who's been patched into the scans, says he's found his mobile emitter. It's buried in Borg Jesus's skull, and is acting as part of his brain. Clearly, this is going to make using it a wee bit inconvenient. We do still have an option in that regard, though. As Seven is updating Janeway on all the improved capabilities of Borg Jesus, and saying she's blocked the transmitter that gets installed in all Borg in case they get disconnected, she mentions that his shielding is not yet online, so, you know, we could off the bugger if Janeway wants. But Janeway does not want, not unless there's no alternative. Straight up murdering the guy isn't appealing to her, perhaps because he's not in a Starfleet uniform and begging for mercy. Instead, she sees the chance to educate Borg Jesus on the values of being an individual. Drones fresh from the oven don't have any built-in behaviour beyond awaiting instructions, and Janeway thinks this could be a chance to convert it. And who better to guide Borg Jesus in the difficult process than Seven herself? To that end, Seven returns to the science lab. Borg Jesus has grown a bit since we last saw him, and it's time to disconnect from the incubator. Attempts to explain that he will not be a member of the Borg as initially programmed fall on deaf ears. Seven thinks connecting to him directly is the answer and plugs her tubes into his neck. This meets with some success and she says he's learning. He seems to like it, too, grabbing hold of her arm so she can't disconnect. She orders him to release her, an order that's ignored, until she says that he's hurting her. Interesting. We're trying a less potentially dangerous way of giving Borg Jesus an education. Data modules containing a variety of information are prepared for him, though not everybody on the crew thinks this is a great idea. Borg Jesus is rather partial to them, though, and, after his first taste, requests more. Not just yet, says Seven, as his brain needs time to adapt to the new information. Let's go for a medical checkup while we wait. Borg Jesus doesn't like the prospect of leaving Seven, but complies after being told that she'll join him later. Neelix tries to make him feel welcome as we travel to sickbay, but Borg Jesus has questions, many of which Neelix does his best to dodge. The Doc isn't so lucky and gets lumbered with trying to explain Borg Jesus' origin to him. Being told how he was created makes him concerned that he's unwelcome, a fear that the Doc does a pretty good job of countering with an explanation that this ship exists to find new life, and he certainly qualifies. That's all gone well enough, so let's introduce him to other parts of the ship. Engineering is the first stop, despite an unwelcome response from Balana. She's busy trying to figure out how to predict the growth of that science wibbly we were looking at back when the show started. Borg Jesus knows the answer and, with Balana's permission, writes an algorithm to do the job. Balana's impressed, a change that pleases Seven, so it's time to show him off to the captain. It all goes splendidly, and Janeway's delighted by his progress. With her permission, he leaves to help Balana improve the Boussard collectors, perhaps so we don't have to land on any more demon planets. Once he's left, Janeway compliments Seven on his progress, saying he's adapting to the point of developing his own personality. But that's a double-edged sword. Seven is concerned about his requests for information on the Borg. It's natural to be curious about your origins, but what if he decides their goals are more closely aligned to his than Starfleet? Janeway adds another layer of complexity with moral concerns. If Borg Jesus is an individual, then we have no right to keep the information from him. Eventually, he'll have to be told. Not today, though. It's time for bed, and after he's once again asked for data on the Borg, he complies with using a regeneration alcove. Once he's been told how to use it properly, anyway. As he recharges, some LEDs on his neck begin to flash, and we switch to a view of a Borg battle bollock flying through space. It's detected a signal and is moving to check it out. Shit, as they say, is about to go south. 
Seven wakes to find herself faced by Janeway and a lot of guns. Janeway knows about the signal and wants Borg Jesus woken to find out what the fuck he's playing at. He doesn't know what we're talking about, and scans prove this to be true. Another transmitter created itself in his body, a failsafe if the first didn't work. The whole thing was automated. Tuvok tells us we've got about three hours till the Borg turn up as we've detected a transwarp what's it, and Borg Jesus says he wants to meet them. We're out of time to ease him into things gently, so we go for the crash course. Recordings in astrometrics show what the Borg are capable of and what they do to those they take. Borg Jesus expresses a desire to experience the hive mind, and Janeway explains that this would result in the subjugation of his individual personality. Confirmation from Seven that this would be a generally negative thing goes some way to convincing him, but he asks for time to consider. Unfortunately, time is something they don't have. The Borg ship is here. I guess we must have been doing this for three hours. We all go up to the bridge and get ready for a fight, as Borg Jesus describes feeling anxiety. The Borg tactical testicle arrives and starts to pull us in. After an urging from Seven to resist the voices they can hear, Borg Jesus links into Voyager's systems and breaks them free. He has a go at giving us better shields and guns while he's at it. Tests prove less than useful when the Borg bollock pulls an Uno reverse card on our yellow poop and causes some kabooms on the bridge. Borg Jesus can't do anything more over here, but thinks he can fuck them up from within if he goes over to the tactical testicle. Janeway agrees and orders Kim to do teleporty things, but Borg Jesus has his own. Show off. Threats from the Collective don't impress Borg Jesus much, and he goes to upset some tables in the temple. Normal drones give him no trouble, and he links to the battle bollock, flying it into the science wibbly. The Wibbly crushes it like the heel of a Dom's boot, and it pops, but Kim detects one survivor. It's Borg Jesus, and we teleport him to sickbay. He's super injured, and we need to start treatment. A slight problem, he tells us to sod off. The Borg know about him now, and his existence puts them all in danger. The Doc tries to treat him anyway, which I'm pretty sure is a breach of ethics, but Borg Jesus has it covered and stops him with a shield. He cocks it, and Seven leaves. In the cargo bay, Seven turns off Borg Jesus' bed, rather raising the question of why they're left running to begin with. She does a bit of a cry and catches herself in the mirror, and we leave her to contemplate having found the emotion she was looking for at the start of the episode as we fly away. There are some good points to pick at in this one, so let's dive in. At the start of the episode, Seven is annoyed that the dock just enters the cargo bay unannounced, Whilst some of this is embarrassment from her practicing how to smile, the parallel with him considering the sick bay to be his residence is clear. Both sets of schematics I've seen for the Intrepid class show there's an abundance of crew quarters. It's a point I've made before, that the Dock and Seven aren't afforded the same level of normality that the rest of the crew and even visitors are given as standard. You could argue there's a trade-off of increased space over privacy, I guess, but is it really your space when it can be taken away whenever others need it? The main meat of the episode is Borg Jesus, of course, or, more accurately, Seven's interactions with him. Seeing the situation she was in when she joined Voyager, but this time from the opposing perspective. Dealing with the knowledge that they could turn into hero or villain, tempered by the desire to show compassion despite her initial hesitation. Having Borg Jesus hang around for a couple of episodes would have done much to highlight the impact of their loss, but we've been here before with Tuvix and the Doc's holographic daughter, so I expected nothing more. Borg Jesus's childlike behaviour, the flinch at being approached, the desire to not leave Seven's side, does much to endear him to the viewer. I certainly have more time for the actor here than the last time we saw them. Because we have seen them before. I'm not great with faces, but I do have a relatively good ear for voices, and as soon as Borg Jesus started talking, I clocked him as our old friend, Sad Nazi, from the Killing Game two-parter of last season. In that one, he managed to provide the most unintentionally funny moment of the season, but here he does a more thorough job. That said, his clipped, crisp tones were easily recognisable, which is not ideal for repeat appearances. There's nothing inherently wrong with reusing actors, and Trek has quite the history of it. Someone like Jeffrey Coombs, whose versatility let him play both Brunt and Wayun in Deep Space Nine, without it being obviously apparent that it was the same guy, is a good example. But the recognition here pulled me out of the story and led to a diversion of going to check if I was right. 
and anything that gets in the way of the story is inherently a bad thing. Still, that doesn't stop the episode being a pretty good one, provided you don't think too hard about the initial premise that made it happen. To be fair, that's a sentence we can say about a lot of Trek stories. As a final point, I note that Neelix is the crew member who's most willing to be welcoming of Borg Jesus in this one. Had Kez still been with us, I suspect she would likely have been written into that role. Does this mean that Neelix is taking over those duties, and if so, what can we infer of his development and the influence of Kez? Again, this is a question I asked in the previous season when he was bunking in sickbay. Is Neelix turning out to be the secret character growth I've been asking for all along? We shall be watching the rest of the season with increased interest. End of episode. Hello, it's Space Dog again. I've heard some rumbling among the crew about having another go at getting computer out of the teleport. What's it? Something about doing an invert phase frequency uh polarity um forty seven. Look, I'm a dog, what do you want from me? Anyway, they think it'll probably do something and that something might not be a kaboom. Janeway likes those odds apparently. <laughs> Hey up, looks like we're off. Wish him luck. Woof.